cash balances of the individuals in the various countries. There would be no danger of gold deserting some countries and piling up excessively in others, for each individual would take care not to let his cash balance shrink or expand to a size which he considered inappropriate in view of his own income and wealth. Under a 100% gold standard, the various countries would have a common monetary system, just as the various states of the United States now have a common monetary system. There would be no more reason to worry about disequilibrium in the balance of payments of any particular country than there is now reason to worry about disequilibrium in the balance of payments of New York City. If each individual and institution took care to avoid persistent disequilibrium in his personal balance of payments, that would be enough. The actions of individuals in maintaining their cash balances at appropriate levels would automatically take care of the adequacy of each country's money supply. The problems of national reserves, deflation, and so forth, Jaeger points out, are due to the fractional reserve nature of the gold standard, not to gold itself. National fractional reserve systems are the real source of most of the difficulties blamed on the gold standard. With fractional reserves, individual actions no longer suffice to assure automatically the proper distribution of the supply of gold. The difficulties arise because the mixed national currencies, currencies which are largely paper and only partly gold, are insufficiently international. The main defect of the historical gold standard is the necessity of protecting national gold reserves. Central banking and its management only make things worse. In short, whether a central bank amplifies the effects of gold flows, remains passive in the face of gold flows, or offsets gold flows, its behavior is incompatible with the principles of the full-fledged gold standard. Indeed, any kind of monetary management runs counter to the principles of the pure gold standard. In view of this eloquent depiction of the 100% gold standard, why does Jaeger flatly reject it and call instead for freely fluctuating fiat money? Largely because only with fiat money can each governmental unit stabilize the price level in its own area in times of depression. Now, I cannot pause to discuss further the policy of stabilization, which I believe to be both fallacious and disastrous. I can only point out that contrary to Professor Yeager, price declines and exchange rate depreciation are not simple alternatives. To believe this is to succumb to a fatal methodological holism and to abandon the sound path of methodological individualism. If, for example, a steel union in a certain area is causing unemployment in steel by insisting on keeping its wage rates up though prices have fallen, I consider it at once unjust, a cause of misallocations and distortions of production, and positively futile to try to remedy the problem by forcing all the consumers in the area to suffer by paying higher prices for their imports through a fall in the area's exchange rate. One problem that every monetary statist and nationalist has failed to face is the geographical boundary of each money. If there should be national fluctuating fiat money, what should be the boundaries of the nation? Surely political frontiers have little or no economic meaning. Professor Yeager is courageous enough to recognize this and to push fiat money almost to a reductio by advocating, or at least considering, entirely separate monies for each region or even locality in a nation. Jaeger has not pushed the reductio far enough, however. Logically, the ultimate in freely fluctuating fiat monies is a different money issued by each and every individual. We have seen that this could not come about on the free market. But suppose that this came about by momentum from the present system or through some other method. What then? Then we would have a world chaos indeed with Rothbards, Jaegers, Joneses, and billions of other individual currencies freely fluctuating on the market. 
I think it would be instructive if some economist devoted himself to an intensive analysis of what such a world would look like. I think it's safe to say that the world would be back to an enormously complex and chaotic form of barter, and that trade would be reduced to a virtual standstill. For there would no longer be any sort of monetary medium for exchanges. Each separate exchange would require a different money. In fact, since money means a general medium of exchanges, it is doubtful if the very concept of money would any longer apply. Certainly the indispensable economic calculation provided by the money and price system would have to cease, since there would no longer be a common unit of account. This is a serious and not far-fetched criticism of fiat money proposals, because all of them introduce some of this chaotic element into the world economy. In short, fluctuating fiat monies are disintegrative of the very function of money itself. If every individual had his own money, the disintegration of the very existence of money would be complete. But national, and still more regional and local fiat monies, already partially disintegrate the money medium. They contradict the essence of the monetary function. Finally, Professor Yeager wonders why such orthodox liberals as Mises, Hayek, and Robbins should have insisted on the monetary internationalism of the gold standard. Without presuming to speak for them, I think the answer can be put in two parts. One, because they favor monetary freedom rather than government management and manipulation of money, and two, because they favored the existence of money as compared to barter, because they believed that money is one of the greatest and most significant features of the modern market economy and, indeed, of civilization itself. The more general the money, the greater the scope for division of labor, and for the inter-regional exchange of goods and services that stem from the market economy. A monetary medium is therefore critical to the free market, and the wider the use of this money, the more extensive the market and the better it can function. In short, true freedom of trade does require an international commodity money, as the history of the market economy of recent centuries has shown, gold and silver. Any breakup of such an international medium by statist fiat paper inevitably cripples and disintegrates the free market, and robs the world of the fruits of that market. Ultimately, the issue is a stark one. We can either return to gold, or we can pursue the fiat path and return to barter. It is perhaps not hyperbole to say that civilization itself is at stake in our decision. Other criticisms by Jaeger are really, as he recognizes at one point, criticisms of any plan for 100% banking, fiat or gold. There is, for example, the problem of how to suppress new forms of demand liabilities that might well arise to evade the legal restrictions. I do not think this an important argument. Fraud is always difficult to combat and indeed continues in numerous forms to this day, as does all manner of crime. Does this mean that we should give up outlawing and punishing fraud and other crimes against person and property? Second, I am sure that the practical problems of law enforcement would be greatly reduced if the public were to receive a thorough education in the fundamentals of banking. If, in short, 100% money advocates were allowed to form anti-bank vigilante leagues to point out the shakiness and immorality of fractional reserve banking, the public would be much less inclined to evade such restrictions than it is now. 9. The 100% Gold Tradition I therefore advocate as the soundest monetary system, and the only one fully compatible with the free market and with the absence of force or fraud from any source, a 100% gold standard. This is the only system compatible with the fullest preservation of the rights of property. It is the only system that assures the end of inflation, and with it, of the business cycle. And it is the only form of gold standard that fully meets the following argument of the Douglas Subcommittee against a return to gold. An override